Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest edition of Patuda interview series. Up to the age of 20, I traveled by airplane three times. Every time, it was a huge event full of excitement and joy. My primary school age son, on the other hand, travels by plane two or three times a year. Well, this was the case before COVID-19 hit us all. Whether we will go back to the previous levels of air travel and when it might happen seem to be turning into questions without answers. We will try to tackle them today, but we'll mainly focus on how the aviation industry on the whole, and EasyJet in particular, are handling the crisis and sustaining the commercial viability of the business as well as the loyalty of their customers. To address all this, we invited the best person for the job, EasyJet's Chief Commercial and Customer Officer, Robert Carey. The interview will be moderated by Alex Dichter, Senior Partner at McKinsey, leader of its global travel practice, and a pilot in the past himself. With them at the controls, I wish you all a wonderful time. Take it away, gentlemen. Anastasia, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, first of all, let me start with your name. Many would uh, look at your name and hear your American accent and assume that you go by Robert, but you don't, you go by Robert. Can you explain to the audience where that comes from? Yeah, happy to. Um, afternoon, everybody. Uh, so Robert, uh, it, it is, I do go by Robert. Um, I'm half French, half American. So my dad's from France originally. Uh, my mom's from the U.S., uh, grew up in, in the U.S., but then uh, spent a lot of summers in France. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, since joining EasyJet, uh, came over and moved over to, to uh, London and have been over here for gosh, just over three years now. Uh, but even prior to that, was uh, traveling around the world, uh, working in the consulting business and working with airlines all over the world. So, so a bit of a global background before coming in. I think we're, we're, we're waiting for Alex to rejoin. Here he is. Alex, right. are you still getting an echo? Uh, I think that sounds better. Yeah, much better. Okay, very good. Uh, by the way, uh, every time I see one of these web conference platforms not doing its job properly, I think, thank goodness, because as long as these technologies are imperfect, uh, there will still be reasons for people to fly. Exactly. I still have a job then. Yeah, exactly. So look, you're no stranger to aviation. And then obviously by your, uh, your personal background, you're no stranger to Europe. And at the same time, uh, I'm sure, uh, like many of us, you were not prepared for a global pandemic. Um, take us back to you know March and April of 2020 uh, and just walk us through what it was like, both on a professional and a personal level, watching this unfold uh, and trying to look after all of the various stakeholders at a company like EasyJet. Yeah, no, I mean, it was a, it was a crazy time. Um, I, I, I remember thinking, I remember seeing the headlines first come in uh, about Corona and COVID in China. And that was in you know, January. We'd just done actually our annual kind of EasyJet Spirit Awards uh, uh, at night. I remember, I remember coming up in my community and thinking to myself, um, oh boy, am I glad I'm not in, in China right now having to deal with this. That'd be a real problem if you were an airline having to deal with something of this scale and you know grounding your flights, but it's continents away. Um, and, and sure enough, I, I remember I was coming back, actually, we had the the winter break here in, in, in the UK and my daughters and my wife and I had all gone skiing together. We were on the way back when the news hit on that Monday about the lockdown starting in Italy. Uh, and we had a management board meeting. We'd had a, we first brought up the topic a week before to kind of dive in and say, are we ready? What were we doing? You know, at the time we were having to start dealing with limited cases showing up on our flights uh, and, and what would be the protocols we followed. And then it just quickly snowballed from there. Um, and I, I can remember uh, we did a bit of a walk afterwards uh, when I was talking you know, with kind of management board, thinking through different things. It was literally weekend after weekend. We just kept getting, you know, a new set of, of restrictions coming in. Inevitably, they would get rumored on Friday night, typically get published. It seemed always on Saturday night uh, and would affect starting on Sunday. And so we were having to literally, I mean, we'd set up kind of a, a commercial group and an operations group to deal with it. Because as you said, I mean, we were dealing with stakeholders. Of, we had... Um, our customers who were many of them down line in the middle of trips. And, you know, especially if you think about a lot of the segments that are traveling in, in a March timeframe, 
you've got a lot of people who have second homes, et cetera, down there for the winter that are far out. So how do we get the message out to them? How do we think about what services we need to provide uh, to get enough people home? Likewise, we have our own crew to think about, and, and I think the crew did a great job throughout. I mean, the, the number of letters I got on, on great service they provided and kind of reassuring everybody. There were the protocols we had to be following, and you know, how do we get the right balance of delivering a safe service in that kind of environment? Um, and literally, I mean, I was, I, I think from what I, looking back, I don't think there was a day in March that we weren't having to real time deal with something. And then it was roughly about the, you know, it was the last third or fourth week when we actually started dealing with the scenario of, look, this has now gone from uh, when it started a 10% of our 20, 10 to 20% of our network being affected to, you know, this is essentially affecting 100% of our network. And there are furlough schemes everywhere and you know, there are lockdowns happening. You know, we actually have to start thinking about the scenario of do we shut down the airline for the, for, you know, the course of, uh, of a time period. And I remember going through that and, and uh, early on we had the kind of conversation that said, you know, somewhere around like 20%. Falling below 20% is probably where that threshold occurs. And, and we kind of snowballed to there. And then there was a whole period of how do we safely shut down an airline? I mean, you just think about the normal processes we go through, everything from you know, keeping the pilots trained, getting our customers home, how do we manage the volume of customers that have now been disrupted? You know, you've got systems, we've got, you know, even like catering to the plane that is all pre-set up and, and kind of on a flow. So how do we manage all that to kind of ramp down safely? Um, and and then get all of our people taken care of. You know, they're all in furlough schemes. So I mean, it was a, it was a kind of nonstop, nonstop effort throughout throughout uh, uh, March and April. To to then you kind of got to the second week of April, and it was just kind of like the the calm and the storm, which was kind of an uneasy feeling uh, being an airline without flights operating and thinking, you know, how do I get this thing back up and running again? So I mean, it was a it was it was a, the one thing I would take away from that uh, continually was, unfortunately, every prediction I had made during that time of when things would start to come back were wrong. Um, and and while I've gotten a few rights since then, you know, there's still a lot of things that you just face every day that are unknown. Yeah. Wow. It's uh, it's amazing to hear uh, how dynamic that that situation must have been. You know, as an operator, you know, as a consultant, you know, we obviously saw things changing as well, uh, but we were more focused on on planning than than the doing, of course. Uh, and of course, we were also wrong about when demand would come back. Um, we have referred to the stages of the recovery variably as the restart, you know, followed by the recovery. Um, you shut down uh, for a couple of months. You're flying now. Uh, I was uh, just checking one of the flight tracking websites yesterday afternoon, and I was pleased to see that, you know, at that moment, there were 2,500 and change uh, narrowbody aircraft in the air, uh, A320s and 737s, not counting regional jets and turboprops, um, which is, of course, lower than normal, but not dramatically no lower than normal. Uh, and so I think it's safe to say we're in the very early stages of the recovery. Um, many of our audience members have asked, uh, you know, when you think uh, we will be back to normal from a demand standpoint, at least. A lot of analysts say 2024. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, uh, it's a question we've been debating quite a bit, as you can imagine. And, and I think probably like every airline out there, we've run probably every possible, well, I say every possible permutation, but I just said that I've been wrong on a lot of things. So maybe not every possible, we've run a lot of permutations of what that could be. I, our baseline scenario right now still anchors on a 2023 recovery for us. And it's a little different, you know, we, we, um, we've run scenarios on 22, 23, 24. And, and as we see it, especially given we're really focused on that short haul you know, intra-European flows, we suspect that's going to come back faster than some of the long hauls. And I, I think if I was doing the aggregated scenario across everywhere, I'd definitely be much more like a 2024 timeframe. But, you know, as we look at the timeframes and what we've tried to do is we've modeled it, thinking about not only, I mean, because you've essentially put together, you're going to have two types of crises come together as we've modeled it. You have one, which is health-related crisis that, you know, pulled the traffic down and we're kind of going through the ups and downs right now of, of more of a, a, a wave type model. And then you're going to have on the back of that kind of the typical economic recession recovery, we think, coming out of here where you're going to have a bit of a ramp up. And, and you know, as we've looked back and modeled it, you have pretty steep drops in the, in the health side when you have the health risk playing in. But it also tends to rebound faster whenever you get the, the, the full, full solution in place. So we expect that to come back quicker. But then when you look at the economic side, at least on short haul travel and, and kind of our core markets, typically it's been about a two year recovery from that point. So that's why we're saying we think, you know, and kind of the modeling we've done says, you know, we think a, a vaccine solution comes out sometime Q1 of next year or calendar Q1. 
uh, which would then, and we think it'll scale out, some, you know, between then and September to really get out. It won't be instantaneous, obviously, uh, but if that starts, kind of when you get into the economic recovery uh, curve from that point on, that puts you squarely into summer 2023 is really when the recovery happens. And look, we we what we've kind of taken as a mantra though is, you know, I think learning from where we've been wrong is really about having the flexibility to react. So, you know, we we we've really designed our fleet plan, our network, everything we're going about to, to reset to what we think is the baseline of where we're going to be at right now, plan it around a recovery curve that hits in 2023, but also be able to flex up or down as we see things uh, actually evolve. Yeah. I mean, what, what you've described is very similar to what a lot of our clients are saying, which is, you know, they've got a reasonable amount of confidence in the economic recovery curve once we get there. Um, you know, the big question on everyone's minds is 2021. Uh, and obviously, there's a big difference between uh, a, a high efficacy vaccine, you know, in January that's quickly rolled out uh, and a series of low efficacy vaccines that don't really get scaled out until the end of 2021. I'm sure that's an enormous amount of volatility between those scenarios. And how, how do you think 2021 will play out and how are you preparing for that? And, you know, I think our, our audience members are interested in multiple dimensions on that question. You know, your capacity, how you think pricing will evolve. Um, you know, how you plan in an environment where, um, you know, those, those changes are going to happen real time. Yeah, no, I'm, it, it, it's the question of the moment right now, um, or one of the questions of the moment. I mean, as we think about, or as I think about 2021, as we think about 2021, I, I think, look, the, you can kind of break it a little bit into chunks. So you're going to have the first part of it, which we expect to still be fairly, you know, downturn as we make it through the winter until the vaccine arrives. So I won't focus as much there because I don't think that's where, you know, probably there's there's as much debate. It's how exactly as you said, how that ramp up curve occurs and also then how it plays into, you know, the summer and the next fall. You know, as, as we've thought about it, and I'll start from network and kind of capacity and then work into the other levers a little bit. I mean, the, the, to be honest, the summer peak is probably where we have the least questions at this point, as strange as that may sound. I mean, summer peak is, is obviously our biggest time. Look in, in back to last summer in 2020, where we clearly had no vaccine um, and no clear path to getting a vaccine. And so the, that, that was not a hope from anybody at that point. But, you know, from our operation, we went from an absolute standstill, first flight again restarted on June 15th, to by the beginning of August, we were at 60% of our peak summer capacity. Now that wasn't with you know, yields and everything. But I mean, to ramp up that quickly and see that demand come back showed us, especially when you've got, uh, let's say, government schemes that, and by schemes, I mean, uh, regulations that people can kind of understand and they can plan around. The planning part is really important when you think about it. People, there was a definitely a part of the population. We saw that in our customer survey data. You know, there was kind of two parts of the customer base. Part of the customer base was ready to go right now as long as they felt they could control the risk and part wanted to wait for a vaccine. So I think, you know, the, the core planning scenario, if you look at it, is the peak we think will be a peak. Um, I think it's how we ramp up into that, which will depend a lot on the, the speed of the vaccine, how cleanly it gets rolled out, and the confidence there. But I think what, what we're planning a lot of for that is how do we maintain flexibility in the ramp up uh, to get there as, as, as quickly as we see. And I think part of where we've invested quite a bit is um, uh, creating the systems and the processes to move faster. So, I mean, we've we moved from a, plan, a world where we built schedules, you know, twice a year following a six to seven month process to doing schedules in two to three weeks on a monthly cycle. And, and you know, so that that time and iteration, you know, is, is, is pretty, pretty interesting. You know, then I think if you get into some of the other elements around pricing, you know, fixed, uh, you mentioned, you know, kind of costs, you know, and some of those elements, you know, on the pricing side, um, uh, we're trying, I mean, right now, it's interesting, you know, there is actually customers booking for next summer. And we see there's still, whether well, there's a real short term, uh, let's say, lack of demand out there as people are uncertain about the regulations right now. And, and you know, we, we have the second wave hitting in Europe, especially. There's still a volume of customers coming for next summer. Um, and we've seen it, you know, we launched our summer schedule earlier than we ever have before. And we've seen a you know, pretty good response to that from our customer base, both on the airline and the holiday side. So I think, you know, look, we're going to approach it. Um, from a, a, a fairly, let's say, pri standard pricing, as standard as can be in the current moment of saying, look, we want to get some demand built early. We want to get that onto the planes. Uh, and then, you know, as we, we get closer, we'll think about what's going to be the, the price that matches capacity. And I think that'll depend a lot on, you know, how much capacity exactly ends up in the market between us and our competitors. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, we're looking a lot at that. We're actually looking right now quite a bit at how do we modify our pricing models to react more real time to 
future indicators as opposed to historical, which will play in more into long term, but I think especially help in 2021. You know, on the cost side, we're doing a lot of work right now um, to, to try and reset our cost base. And I think, you know, EasyJet has said that fairly publicly about, you know, we, we, we want to get, um, we want to get our costs reset, you know, given the context that we're in. You know, we've got, uh, unfortunately, some tough processes we're working through with our crew and our people right now to get our headcount right sized uh, to the airline we're, uh, size we're going to be at next summer, which is around 300 aircraft. Um, and we're also looking at other costs and working with, you know, partners around airports and other key areas to make sure that we we, we have the cost base to succeed here. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of work going on there. Um, and then I think the, 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 the other element, though, where we, we, you know, to call out, I think, especially looking to 2021, is how do we get our people ready? Because when you just think about some of the journey our people have been on it's been a, a you know an incredible up and down momentum of just, you know you had the as you said the march april time frame you had a shutdown we ramped back up now you're in a trough but you know how do we get that energy and passion back we're an airline known for you know the great service we deliver our, uh, to our customers and we want to make sure we really have that winning customer proposition coming back in the next summer which relies so much on our employees so that's kind of the, the the other element we're thinking through is how do we get that customer experience really right uh, uh, for our customers around, you know, every element of the travel experience. It sounds like you're going to have your hands full uh, in 2021, and we, we certainly share uh, your optimism uh, for the idea that, that travel will be back uh, and that at some point uh, in the next year, this will be largely behind us. Um, you've described this sort of dichotomy between customers that are ready to travel uh, and, uh, and prepared to manage the risk and those that aren't. Um, a lot of people are asking, you know, what are the sort of behavior changes that we might see from consumers that would be permanent uh, and what won't change? You know, are you starting to think out to the future and learning from how people are behaving today to think about how you might adapt the value proposition in the future? Oh, I, I mean, one, of the, one of the things we're really trying to do right now is, you know, and, and I've been very conscious with our teams is, is really make sure we're splitting our thinking both on the short term. So what do we need to do, you know, to get the maximize performance right now, but also thinking a bit longer term what's shifting, uh, both on a commercial and a customer perspective. I mean, a couple of things I'd call out. I think one we've seen that, that I think you'll see stay afterwards. Uh, one is around the booking patterns and the booking window. You know, uh, it's been really fascinating to watch over the past summer how that booking pattern evolved because, you know, there was that consumer mindset where we'd see new markets open, all of a sudden people would rush in and book. And people were booking on much shorter time frames than typically would, which, which makes sense. We lost three months of a typical booking season between April and, and June. Um, but, but what that changed was, you know, we saw less price sensitivity in the market from our customers, actually. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, typically uh, we'd, we'd see a lot of shopping behavior. Customers want to make sure they get the, the best price. And, and so when we put a message out, you know, through our own channels to a customer, we'd see a reaction to a price-based message but it didn't really trigger a new behavior. If they were thinking of buying, they went and looked and actually they converted their ticket, their, their purchase behavior faster. Um, so we saw a much faster you know, uh, cycle time than we would normally see. I think you're gonna see those patterns play out, continue to play out because people have started to adapt now and they're getting more comfortable with that. And it fits with the general trend of the world around us and how you can, you know, I can, I can buy a, you know, my, my wife bought a crock pot on Amazon last night and it arrived at our door today. So, I mean, that's, you know, people are comfortable with that buying cycle right now and have been accelerated forward. You know, I think the second one obviously will be around the manner of booking. I mean, the takeoff of digital and mobile first, we talked it all, we all talked about it. We're obviously a very digitally focused airline, but I mean, I, I just get amazed when you think about some of these trends and, and you know, there was one, we're talking with our, our one of our marketing partners and they were saying, you know, 75% of people shifted to what to a more digital on-demand consumption model during the course of, of of the last six months which i mean makes sense it's not a it's not it's not rocket science to get there but the stat is pretty overwhelming you think you know how is that going to play out in every element that we do i mean customers want you know and they expect a seamless digital experience from booking to the airport to on board to after the flight and they you know they, they they want that experience, and especially our customer set is 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 wanting it. So how is that going to affect how we reach our customers? Even I mean, you know, we were we're even thinking through, you know, how do we shift our marketing model to our customers? Because you know, previously we launched a promo, we put the ads on TV during core programming, it'd be showing on buses across you know London, it'd be showing in the evening standard newspaper. But you know what? Nobody's looking at buses or billboards right now that much. Nobody's reading newspaper free newspapers at the train station. And even watching TV at a set program, nobody wants to do that necessarily anymore. So how do we have to shift everything we're doing? Uh, I think it's those are trends that were there before, but accelerate. 
Um, I think the other, you know, the other, the other um, uh, one obviously is around business traffic. You know, I think there'll be a shift there. You know, you were joking about platforms like this, and you know, while they have issues, they're, and they're still going to definitely be a segment that travels in business. You know, there's going to be some things that shift. You know, mice meetings and conventions. Uh, I mean, nobody's been at one for six, eight months now. And, uh, you know, I think people are really going to rethink how you bring them back up. When do I use online or offline um, events? You know, big sales group meetings or actually even, you know, the classic consultant, I'm going just to somewhere, you know, eight hours away for one meeting and then coming home. While that is important sometimes, and I think you'll see some of that because uh, there has to be some stuff in person, you know, people are getting much more comfortable doing other stuff online. And, and I think you'll see some shifts there. But it, it won't be all bad. Um, you know, a lot of these I talked about were lowering demand. I think you're going to see some new segments pop up too. I mean, it's been interesting. You watch like some of the this, this uh, nomadic kind of traveler uh, lifestyle that you, that's being created right now, and we see it even in in our teams' populations where you know people have gone home to their home countries during the lockdowns, and even as we work from home, and it's create you know we're rethinking our working model with how do we support people remote working where maybe the model becomes yeah I come back to the office a couple times a month but I'm actually living somewhere else. Now that's gonna create new travel patterns and new new behaviors and new segments. So, I mean, there, there's some interesting interesting customer changes happening there. We're, you know, we're thinking through how do we make sure we get a customer experience designed to that? And that really stands out. And I think, you know, for us, a lot of it will be built around ease, which kind of fits with our name. But one, one of those uh, patterns that you mentioned, you know, I, we've, we've read a lot about, which is the idea that people will take workations and so, uh, you know, they might not be off of work and the kids might not be off of school, but let's go someplace else. Let's settle in. We'll take the tests that are required to get into the country and uh, and we'll work from there. Are, are you seeing that in the data? Are you seeing longer lengths of stay? Um, not yet, honestly, but it's 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 hard to, I mean, to be honest, we probably, um, we're still early to be able to see that data pretty effectively. I mean, we saw, what, and it's probably masked a little bit because if you look at the data, we did see some shrinkage of some of the normal kind of length of vacation people were going on this summer where they were probably cutting back. You know, they're tip, pretty typical in our uh, in our, t our customer sets where they'll take off one or two nights on their, their vacation, kind of save a little money because that's where the, the bulk of the spend is. So that's probably balancing that out a bit in the trends. Um, but it is definitely something coming out there. We can start to see segments popping up and, you know, reactions to that. And even talking with some of the customers, you can see the segment. Well, I, I took one myself this summer. So uh, we, we, you know, we were kind of sitting at home. We just con construction happening on both sides of our house. It was hot. We said, let's go somewhere. And, you know, the kids weren't in school anyway. So we went for a week and I worked from there while the kids got to have a good time uh, and, and definitely a new segment coming out. Great. Um, at least for me, your image has been replaced by a, an icon of a robot. Uh, I assume that means that your internet connection is a little bit unstable, but I can still hear you. So let's carry on. Um, you know, let's shift a little bit to the industry landscape. Uh, well, there you go. Um, I'll ask the question. I think Robert knows what's, what's going to happen, but I think we'd be curious to hear Robert's views on how the industry landscape might change uh, coming out of this and where we might see winners uh, and losers across the ecosystem. Um, you know, certainly if we reflect on uh, the global financial crisis, there were huge changes in the structure of the banking industry coming out of that. Um, some going away, um, you know, small banks becoming big, um, changes in terms of who did what and, and, and where value lies. Uh, if you can still hear me, Robert, I'd love your views on how the industry might change. I, I can hear you. Can you see me on that little robot? Uh, to me, you're still a robot, but I remember what you look like. So okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll keep going for now. Um, see if I see if I change back at some point. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, I think look, industry trends. It's 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 hard to say. I think at this point, exactly how everything was going to play out. And I think you know we've you know we've spent some time thinking about it, but even you know I, I think been pretty much focused on. Uh, managing just the short term and then out, you know, the few years of what we need to deliver. I mean, I, I think where you're going to see some winners, you'll see a couple trends come out of here that will define the winners. Let me start by that, and then let's say who plays best. Um, I, I think data, uh, not not to overplay the data card, data underlying and data analytics underlying what airlines uh, specifically do will really drive a lot of the successful players out of here. And and I know everybody's saying that right now, but you think about the core dimensions that it's going to pull from, you know, network design pricing, you know, digital customer, I think are all elements that, that you think about the applications of data analytics. And we're working you know, furiously on that right now. And it, it, it kind of, if, 
if we had a honey-do list of things we had to get through before we came into COVID, that list is longer and we're working through it faster than we ever have before. Um, and, and I think we'll see some real movement there uh, from the winners um, out coming out of this. Um, you know, I think secondly, I'd call it the way of working will define the winners. You know, I, I said earlier, I jokingly said we can build a schedule now in uh, two to three weeks, which we can. Uh, but you think about just the pace that, you know, I, I think all travel players are going to have to move at. Um, and it's really embracing a much more agile mindset. You know, part of what we've done uh, in the, the commercial and customer area is, is really embrace it and, and started to break down some of the functional silos uh, that historically have defined uh, uh, the commercial side and the customer side and started creating, you know, cross-functional teams to react and adapt. And I think that's going to have to be the way of working going forward where you won't be talking about I'm part of the schedule team or I'm part of the marketing team or I'm part of the customer team or I'm part of the schedule team. Uh, I'm part of, you know, the the scrum team or I'm part of agile team, which, you know, may shape and form when I'm from that team for the next four weeks and then I'm, I'm reforming from there. And I think that'll much be be much more uh, a majority of the, the way uh, people are working in customer and commercial will go. So what does that mean? I think who's going to win out of that? Um, I, I, look, I, I, I think you'll see a couple trends coming out. I think the uh, you'll see, I do think you're going to see consult, more consolidation come out of here eventually. I mean, I can't tell you the time frame that'll occur, um, and it'll depend a little bit by market. But, um, you know, you saw this back in the 2008, 2010 time frame in the U.S. market coming out of the financial crisis over there. There's a lot of consolidation in the next four or five years afterwards. Um, I think you're going to see that around the world, and maybe in different shapes and different forms. But ultimately, you know, you you, you can't have the whole industry operating at kind of this uh, let's say where we're all being subsidized to essentially stay. So ultimately, you're going to have to get some consolidation there to get to new trends. Um, you know, I think you're going to see. Uh, I think do think you're going to see the low cost and the ultra low cost models, you know, continuing to be successful. They play, you know, and and I think it's a combination of you know the cost model that that all of us follow and 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 I think really plays well to the markets. And I think as well, uh, you know, the, it also the speed at which a lot of us can operate and move at, you know, you just just uh, makes it so that we can come up with, with winning products. Um, but if you broaden it out as well, beyond airlines even, and, and, and not to say the legacies aren't going to be successful, but just to think about some of the other sectors, I mean, think about like OTAs, distribution market there, you think about some of the supply chain. I mean, I think, that, by the way, you'll see a lot of reinvention. I mean, if we're getting hit hard, you think about the uh, food providers, the ground handling companies, the MRO providers, all are getting, you know, severely impacted as well as volumes are down. And I think you're going to see some reinvention of that space as, you know, probably you think about something like uh, on board, probably more retail players may look into it as kind of a new opportunity. You think about uh, other space as well. And you go to OTAs, distribution, you know, I think as well there, um, I, I mean, look, my own feeling is probably the OTAs will, will continue to actually do well in this because they, they're pretty well versed at adapting to the different environments. And as much as you know, that we can debate um, whether they are uh, adding, you know, more value in or competing with an airline or who's ultimately owning the customer. I think you'll continue to see them, especially as they probably build capabilities around some of these new leisure and customer experience elements that our customers are going to want uh, in the front end version that, that they will do well at, at, at delivering. I think distribution is a more interesting, you know, broader distribution beyond that will be more interesting. You think about some of the travel agencies, um, et cetera, around the world and, and, you know, I think there's probably a bit more questions there. You know, you think about some of the new distribution concepts coming in, such as NDC and how I present out my content. Again, I think what'll be interesting to see there is uh, many of the leading players are already there and thinking about that dynamic capability of how they can present their content. So what's going to be the new elements you can bring? How can you create some new partnerships in that space that may bypass the traditional uh, distribution players you have there as you come to market? So um, that'd probably be my... You know, my quick run through. Ah, the other one I left out, you know, uh, tourism. I think tourism will be an interesting one to see how that evolves as well, where, you know, especially as we get into the restart, you know, where um, we, we've always been a, a big leisure player around Europe um, and, and serving, you know, the top destinations customers want to go to. Uh, we see the trends continuing there where we think that'll come back fastest. We think we're well placed. And so we're working very closely, not only with airports, but some of the tourism providers to, to restart and, and bring back the customers as quickly as possible. Because that really, you know, is important for them. And, and it's a good partnership opportunity where, where we can really help out. And, and you've seen it, you know, we just announced two new bases last week. And that's part of our strategy around really making sure we're leading in those, those leisure markets. Great. That, that maybe pivots to one of the questions that our audience has asked, and I think it's a good one, and that's about collaboration. And 
the role that you know multi-party collaboration in the ecosystem might play uh, as uh, as we get through the recovery, but quite frankly, in in the new industry that we've reinvented on the back of COVID. Are there any other examples of of how you see you know that kind of collaboration you know playing out differently today than would have been the case six months ago? Yeah, you know, it's interesting when you think through. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of been a slightly of uh, the therapeutic element to get you through the the whole uh, COVID period. It's not only been uh, uh, like say uh, just chatting with some of the you know my counterparts at some of our partner companies to see what's going on with them because it at least feels good to know you're not the only one seeing the same trends sometimes. But then actually working through, we've seen some really good uh, partners step up and uh, want to work together with us and trying to bring solutions faster because everybody recognized we could come out of it, it together faster. I think you know we've worked pretty effectively. You know, we've done some work with um, just a few. I mean, we were we we have a car trawler uh, who we use um, for our, our our car rentals uh, and car hire the uh, website. And we've done a lot of work with them, thinking about what patterns they're seeing. How can we work together in in some of the behaviors to to try and stimulate and think about even new offers we can bring to market together. Uh, you know, we've worked with uh, DoHop. Obviously, provides our worldwide platform, which is our self connect platform. And again. Another chance we worked with them on thinking through how do we think about new uses of this to kind of bring more customers in faster. Uh, you know, Google's actually been a partner with us as well. We've worked with some of them, and they've been a good thought partner in challenging us in some of the ways we've been thinking and so thinking about data sets we can bring and that we've been leveraging. To think about our um, our commercial model that we want to bring. Um, so I mean, it, it, it's been really interesting actually across the board. I would say you've seen everyone we have really close partnerships with. And are really the core providers we do, you know, we work with. Everybody kind of pitched in together to say, look, you know, I remember in, in April and May, the you know, with each of those part, each of our major partners, I literally had a sit down conversation to say, right, how can we, um, how can we really work together at bringing, um, bringing some new solutions to life that'll help both of us. Uh, and it was actually among the most exciting parts, especially during the grounding, to work together on these things because you, yeah. you saw the, the the future where it could go. That's uh, really inspiring to to hear. I think that uh, this is an industry that for too long has seen itself as a zero sum game, and it's nice to see that kind of collaboration. Um, you know, continuing to pivot to questions from the audience, and hopefully, by the way, many of you will notice that some of the questions that you submitted uh, in advance, I've kind of worked into the questions that uh, I've asked Robert in the last thirty minutes. Um, but what I'm going to do at this point is kind of bundle some of the questions together into groupings. Um, might find uh, it a little bit easier to respond, Robert. I think the first one is there's a lot of interest uh, from the audience, both beforehand and now, uh, in what EasyJet will do differently uh, in the future as a result of this. And you've already mentioned a couple of things. You've talked about you know much faster cycle times on scheduled development and shrinking the planning cycle. Um, but I think there's two parts to that question. You know, one person asked, you know, what would you have done differently with 2020 hindsight? Uh, in April and May, is there anything that that you 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 would have done differently? I think second, a lot of interest in innovation, uh, and so coming out of this, and I'll touch on some of the things that audience members have asked: innovation around loyalty, uh, innovation around um, you know somebody asked about Wi-Fi and mentioned a, a trial that you've done with Imfly, and um, that audience member knows a lot about that trial. And if I had to guess, they might work for Imfly, um, but uh, but 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 anything in that sphere. Where you might be offering, you know, new concepts to customers. Subscription revenue came up, uh, and someone even asked, you know, will you be flying long haul? Can we expect to see EasyJet flying to New York uh, in the next? Few years? Well, we'll start with the easy one, which is no, we haven't modified our plans to go long haul. Uh, so I'll tick that one off the list. But I, I mean, look, if I take a step back, um, you know, you start from with hindsight, twenty twenty. Is there anything we would have changed about what we did in, in especially the March April timeframe? Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I've thought through that question many times over the last months because you know it's always the question you ask yourself. Um, I don't think there's much I would have done differently, honestly. Um, I, I mean, look, I could say I, I think on the one hand I could say, look, yep, yeah, run some scenarios around a global pandemic and been ready to go, et cetera. But honestly, I don't know if that's realistic to believe we would have done. And so it's it's a nice theoretical concept. And I, and I do think there's learnings there on the kind of scenario we should be ready for and, and have thought through. Maybe not the specificity of what's happened now, but at least broadly speaking, that that you know we could probably do uh, more risk-based analysis in that sense. Um, I think the only thing I, I think the the part that that 
personally, I, I feel I think we could have done a little bit better on, and I think we really tried to make some amends for it over the last you know four or five months. Uh, would be a little bit more on the customer side. You know, we had a little focus on customer in the March and April timeframe, trying to get them home, et cetera. But you know, you think about the stats that happened afterwards, and 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 I don't think we thought early enough on about the problems that would build up. So, so I mean, just to put it in perspective, a normal summer period from April to August or September, we would cancel uh, 2,500 flights, 2,500 flights over that whole season. You know, from April to I think it was June alone, we canceled 250 uh, million, or no, not million, sorry, 250,000, 100 times our normal rate of cancel of cancellation. And you just think about, and that doesn't, Account customers also had changes, etc. And so, what we kind of saw hit out of there was we started tactically solving a lot of the customer issues. But then, you know, some of those quick solutions kind of snowballed uh, and created not great experience for our customers. Especially, we started getting back flying. And I think that's the one thing we probably could have. You know, if I look back, that's the one thing I probably would have uh, said, "Hey, make sure you're thinking far enough ahead of what are the future problems you're going to develop, and not not necessarily change the, the decisions we came to." Because we did a lot of great things. I mean, we got. Uh, you talk about innovation. Uh, the, the, I was amazed the IT team got together, you know, a voucher solution that had in, endlessly been in our backlog queue as something six to nine months worth of work was done in nine days. I mean, it was incredible what they put together. And, and you know, what I'm going to change, but how it came and how I thought through how that fit with some of the other customer solutions, probably the one thing. Yeah, now, switching to innovation going forward, um, I, I think the main areas for us, I mean, you, you hit on a few, but I think the main areas we're looking at are number one, you know, pricing and revenue management, as we talked about, and and really the concept we've got going there is um, how do we think about new data sources, more forward-looking data sources, and also integrated data sources that are pulling from across pricing, marketing, ancillaries, and not just think about ticket ancillary, but everything we can do to think about you know a much more customer-based relationship of what we're trying to deliver to them uh, and the services we're trying to tee up, and 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 how do we get then the pricing right to to, to serve those customers. Uh, and what's the most efficient way to reach those customers, um, you know, and, and approach that. I think that's one huge area of innovation we're focused on. Uh, I think the second area of innovation we're um, really focused on uh, is around our digital interfaces and how we deliver our customer service there. And, and, and I mean, it fits with the trends probably I mentioned earlier. But again, you know, we've been a leader in the digital space and, and, and I think, you know, credit, credit to our teams. We've got, uh, you know, people love the app, people love the website and, and all those are great. But you know, we can get better at them and we can think about new ways of employing you know, some of the technology that's out there today to really revolutionize some of the customer experiences. And I think, again, you know, uh, one of the that I talked with my team about is it's about differentiation at the end of the day. So what are going to be those points in, in a digital experience that would really stand out from other airlines and not just be another me too element of, of delivering something. So I think that's where we're focused. Um, that's kind of two big areas. I think the one thing I call out that, you know, you won't, it's, it's funny, you mentioned uh, uh, in-flight Wi-Fi. You know, we're looking at the in-flight model a little bit, and 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 I think there's some opportunity for digital innovation over there. Um, you know, that said, uh, and we'll we'll probably look at some some things over there. But I think that said, the one thing I'd say underlying it is, you know, we're 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 known for our people, we're known for the service the crew brings. And I think they're spectacular. Um, I mean, our crew are just the, you know, the excitement they showed getting back on the plane, the service. I I flew with them over the summer multiple times, and and you know, it's part of my my. You know, I'll be honest, the part that I miss most right now of probably working from home, uh, in addition to seeing my teams, is getting to fly, see the crews, chat with them, et cetera, uh, which I haven't done now for probably you know since since COVID started. And that's tough. And, and I think this crew are just outstanding and that's going to continue to be a core part of what we deliver because you know they do a great job. Great. Uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, using digital platforms for launching offers and getting customers to respond. Uh, a couple of people have asked about, you know, the communications challenge of restoring confidence. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I've talked to many clients about this, and I'm reminded of a cartoon I saw years ago where a couple of hikers are standing in front of a trail, and there's a sign that says that the Forest Service would like to let you know that there are very few bears on this trail. And uh, they have, of course, wide eyes. And the point being, uh, you know, there's this delicate balance between instilling confidence in the protocols that we're using, um, but at the same time, not reminding people on a regular basis that there's a pandemic out there and that they should be worried. Um, have, you, have you thought about that? And, and how will you think in 2021 as vaccines become available of letting people know that it is okay to fly again? Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely been a topic. Of, uh, we've gone, you know, we, we, I remember sitting down and, and we probably started really diving in, in in late April, early May 
uh, somewhere around there was when we really started picking up and saying, right, at some point we're going to get back flying again. We, you know, and and you know the way we thought about it is you're going to have two two messages you almost want to deliver to all the customer base, and part of that message is. Uh, let's say the experience, the magic, the joy of travel that kind of instills, that gets them excited to travel, that's going to really appeal to that customer segment I talked about earlier who is ready to travel. But there's also a lot of customers who you want to reassure and say, look, fly with us. It's going to be safe, you know, uh, from a COVID. I mean, we're always safe in operations, but safe from a COVID standpoint, we've got these standards in place and reassuring them. And it's finding that right balance. You know, I think we've, the, the way we've managed it a little bit uh, to date is we've been shifting a bit the messaging as we we need to and where the customers are. So very early on, we went much heavier on reassuring customers. So we put out a uh, a COVID pledge around kind of what what we were going to deliver to our customers, confidence pledge, and what they could could believe in us. You know, around how the standards we're using on the plane. We've been following, uh, and we actually helped trial some of the EASA standards that got put out there early on to be one of the leaders there. Uh, we did some interesting things as well beyond the confidence pledge. We did a a, a mask campaign for kids over the summer where we um, did some designer masks that kids could get on board the plane. Again, to make it a little bit fun, we put out some videos to help reassure customers. And I think all that went very well. We toned that, we, we kind of slowed that down as we got into peak summer and we saw customers coming back. Um, really what we saw is at that point, it wasn't changing many customers' minds. You know, there was a lot of customers who were just saying, look, I'm gonna wait for the vaccine. So there was no message we could have out there to reassure them. And a lot of the other customers were getting on a plane. And once they got on a plane, they said, actually, doesn't feel that bad. You know, I've got to wear a mask the whole time. Service on board's a little bit different. Ironically, the boarding experience, people were saying, was better than normal because it was very orderly. Um, and so they were kind of reassured. Now, now as we come back into this period, I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we're coming back to the question again as we think ahead to next summer. And we're, we're actually, uh, a lot of what we're focusing on right now is confidence to book, but less on the safety measures in place, which are there, but much more on the because because the point of let's say pain and frustration for our customers right now is the changing regulations they face and that's really hard and that's been a constant pain point but it's particularly acute right now uh to your point i think part of the frustration we hear from our customers is you know it's if i'm flying there's multiple forest services that may put up signs on the bears and they are not you know it's kind of like saying one is saying well you know there's one bear per ten thousand acres here which is a big risk and it's saying well there's one bear per ten thousand which is a small risk so what do we what do i need to comprehend you know, we're trying to reassure our customers right now and get them convinced the mind, you know, around the idea that, look, we're going to give you the flexibility. You've got, you know, we've got free changes in there right now. When we put in, when a quarantine or new regulations come in that severely restricted travel, we've given all of our customers chances to change. We've got good refund policies in place and just give them the confidence to say, look, you should go ahead and book when you see good deals right now. And if things change, we understand that we're going to be here to help you there. And I think that'll, you know, we'll continue to see that's kind of the balance of messaging we need right now, which is, Again, it's it's less on pure price uh, as much as a low cost carrier would expect to say it's it's price, et cetera. You know, it's much more. You know, how do we get some of that spirit of people? You know, love connecting with their families, love going to see their you know vacation favorite vacation spots, going to have a meal at their favorite restaurants, even interacting with the crew. You know, some of our our regulars love being on that kind of plane experience and everything combined with. And you know what? We know things are going to change. That's the one thing we know is is the uh, certainty of the uncertainty, and we're going to be here to give you the policies to deal with that. So it's it's really giving them that confidence right now. Good. A, a couple more sort of bucketed questions, and then I'll, I'll hit you with some quick ones as we close. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a couple of people have reflected on the fact that when demand comes back, it may come back quite quickly. Uh, in fact, we saw that this summer. Um, you know, I think many of us read about the Eurostar website crashing you know, the day after the lockdowns uh, were uh, announced that they were going to end. And I think you may have even ha have had some of those challenges. Um, you know, in the context of preparing for a 2021 where you don't want to overdo it, you don't want to underdo it, you know, what are you doing to get ready for that, you know, potential uh, spike in demand? And, you know, how are you thinking about the role of price? You just mentioned price as, as being something that might be taking a backseat you know, we've seen in China an amazing resurgence of domestic traffic, but prices are down significantly. And so how do you how do you play that balance? I know there's a lot in there, but I want to pack a lot of our audience's thoughts into uh, into one question. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, the name of the game on that is very, uh, variableizing as much as we can to respond as quickly as possible. So, I mean, I, I pointed out, you know, last summer, I think, you know, we went through it. We, we created a process where we were essentially reviewing the demand on every two week basis and adding in flying as we could. And we quickly ramped up 
you know, and, and we hadn't originally planned to get to 60% of capacity in August, but we got there because we saw the demand. And I think that's going to be the name of the game again for this summer. We kind of know, uh, I, 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 let me pause. I think I know, maybe wrong, but you know, roughly where the bookends are going to lie around how this, this, this will work. It's really that curve between it. And even the bookends, you don't, you don't quite know what the peak is going to be. And so it's how do I create the most flexibility I can to respond? And if I see that demand come back and we're down, we're now down where we can start adding in capacity, you know, on a, Two two week basis, we could do it at, at 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 extreme. You know, three weeks is probably what we see to really build up the loads we need, and we continue to do that even right now in responding to consumer demand. So I think that's going to be the name of the game. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, I, I know I did say price was not a core part part of the messaging right now. It's going to come back. I, I think you know when I'm confident when when you start to see that that consumer demand start to really come back. And look, I expect a lot of the industry is going to put in capacity you know capacity pretty quickly. Um, and it's going to come into a lot of short haul markets because you can't you can't stimulate necessarily the long haul. I don't think quite as fast as you can the short haul. So that's going to be the the way a lot of airlines will do it. Um, and it will be a bit of a price competition. But look, that's where you know we're putting a lot of the emphasis as well on making sure we have the cost base to compete in there, um, which you know we 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 try to uh, get make sure we have the the leading in the markets where we're competing, um, and that'll that'll be there. Great. Well, it sounds like you've thought uh, through at least how to respond to uh, the things that we do not yet know. Um, one of our audience members it's asked a, lot a question. Easier, it's a lot easier problem to solve than the... the yes, than yes, I, I agree. How to respond to too much demand is a problem we'd all like to solve. Um, one of our audience mem members asked a question that's very much on, on my mind, uh, and that's, you know, how are you thinking about the potential asymmetry in the industry that comes from the different approaches to government bailouts? Um, that, you know, you may find yourselves over the next few years effectively competing with taxpayers uh, and uh, you know how does that change your long-term thinking yeah no i mean we're already seeing it uh, i mean there's, there's a great chart i saw a couple of weeks ago uh from uh, i think it was hsbc did the chart that kind of plotted you know let's say government levels of support i think it was relative to revenue of the airline uh and let's just say uh, if the left was the greater numbers, we're not on the left-hand side of that chart. Um, which, which I, I mean, I think, look, it's created a lot of asymmetry even to date. And, and you know, um, it, you know, it, it, let's say I don't think it would necessarily be. Uh, we're, we're not necessarily opposed to it because we understand that this is a very challenging time and all of it. But we think it needs to be much fairer in the way it's done. So it's the asymmetry of it that that I think we have an issue with. Um, I think ultimately, though, it's interesting when you see it coming around because while uh, I think it creates um, you know, some, some differences in the way people approach it right now. It also is going to create some interesting questions we have to deal with in an industry come two, three years from now. Um, and we come through this on the other side, you're going to have a lot of these carriers that, that did have large volumes of support that now have to figure out how to repay it. That's going to force some discipline probably into how they approach things at that point. Um, you know, it is going to probably change the dynamics around normally, right? You would expect, uh, as we're coming out of this, some of the weaker carriers would disappear. That would help take, release some of the capacity from, from the industry as, as some of these players go. That's probably not going to happen in the short term. So you're probably going to see, back to the earlier point, a bit more of that price competition early on. And we're all just going to have to work through that till we get to the other side. And, you know, I mean, that said, ultimately, that support won't stay there. And I think the, the efficient carriers will survive at the end of the day. It's gonna, you know, it is, it is a big part of our thinking. And as we think, you know, part of it is how do we make sure we're competing uh, you know, competing against players in a way that ultimately we think is 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 the right way for the certain the, the let's say game board that's been set. Yeah, uh, it's great great to hear. I mean, there's an interesting, I suppose, analogy to the virus itself, which is uh, at least in theory, the more exposed you were and the, the the more painful it was, the more immune you may be. And I think we may find the same thing uh, to be true among airlines. Um, a couple of rapid fire questions uh, from the audience. Yes. Uh, you know, one, you know, you mentioned agility. Uh, and the fact that you're pivoting towards agile ways of working, you know, which departments under you have found that easy and which hard? Uh, interesting. So uh, actually, ironically, I'll tell you, the first department that did it in my area was actually my scheduling team. Uh, and they pilot, they pioneered this almost a year ago now um, and moved to it. And they've actually seen a lot of success working with it. Um, it's a slightly different approach. We took a, a different one now and we've put it in and we've combined uh, members of network, uh, marketing, pricing, customer, and digital teams together into an agile team, uh, and so they they we kicked that off over the summer. They're working it now, and and so we're just you know kind of early into the days of that. But I think you know we're seeing a lot of positives come out, positives in the direction of that and where it could go. So uh, I mean we're we're 
uh, we're still early, but pretty excited about it. And I think um, there'll, there'll still be obviously some things that don't make sense in Agile. Uh, you know, there's still a process of how to go through some things, uh, but but I think there's a lot of potential what we're going to be able to do over there. Great. Um, intermodality. Uh, before COVID, uh, we were all concerned about uh, carbon emissions, uh, and intermodality was was viewed as one of the ways in which we might solve that. You have a great platform worldwide. Uh, for interlining, uh, any changes on the horizon in terms of how you might partner with non-airline players to help move people around Europe? Yeah, no, we're actively looking. I mean, we were one of the leaders on the sustainability front with our carbon uh, offsetting um, commitment that we made, gosh, a year ago now. It feels like a long time ago. Uh, but um, part of that as well is not just around the carbon offsetting, but other ways of thinking about sustainable modes of transport and how do we really create a sustainable transport ecosystem. Um, so yeah, we are thinking about how we can leverage other partners and work together with other partners, especially through something like a worldwide, because at the end of the day, you know, we want to give the most efficient travel solutions to our customers. Uh, and, and, you know, if, uh, uh, if that's going to be via a train for some instances, and that's a better way to do it, then let's work together and, and have someone else provide the train and then we'll provide the air. So yeah, absolutely something we're, we're thinking about. Great. Uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, my favorite question among them, uh, or perhaps the worst, depending on how you think about it, is, uh, you know, what role have you seen as a former management consultant for management consultants in a time like this? And where do you think airlines ought to be doing things by themselves? Um, by the way, as an aside, uh, at least in the early days of COVID, you know, my refrain was, um, you know, I'm a consultant, you need a magician, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure I can help you with that. So my specialty has been empathy uh, more than anything. Um, but would love your thoughts. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's, uh, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I look, uh, having been a former management consultant, I do think there's uh, a role for consultants. Um, and I think, you know, it's especially, you know, where, where, where we found it successful and I think where I've seen the best partnerships work, you know, having both been, by the way, on the consulting side and then also on the management side, uh, thinking about it, you know, it's really where there's um, usually, let's say, a problem that has a fairly clear definition that uh, the management team has bought into needs support to get done, uh, where it's kind of a problem that they, there's not sufficient belief in. Uh, that's that's not really a good recipe for success. Um, you know, two is is where there's a sufficiently large enough opportunity, um, size of the prize to go after together, um, and they can see the impact of what's being done. Uh, and then third, uh, uh, th this is really, I mean, no, no, no shocker. It's about the quality of the people you bring in to work on the project and how their skill set fits with with what's going on. And I think, you know, I've seen uh, uh, being on the management side now, kind of the pros and cons of that in different setups. Um, and I think where where we've gotten the right people focused on the right problem, it's actually added a, a, an incredible amount to our team. Uh, and what we can deliver, and where we've gotten that wrong, it's you know not been really great for either side probably at the end of the day. Um, and so you know um, that that's probably my my thoughts on on how best to work together. I mean, look, I think there's a role, as you said uh, early on, uh, a magician would have been great that could have waved their wand, and that's probably not the role of the consultant. But, you know, even coming out now, you've got a lot of you know I think uh, a lot of the problems that I laid out you know are going to take some different ways of thinking and and you know I'm even challenging myself with a you know fairly strong aviation background and and some exposure in other sectors to think through how do we bring in different approaches you know how do we think about you know not how an airline would approach this but actually consumer company or retail company etc because actually uh, there's some real merit in blending some of those approaches and I think there's a lot of value there great well I think that's good advice for uh, for many um, well, look, there are several more questions that have come in, but we are uh, sort of rounding the, the end of the hour. Uh, and so perhaps you might consider a promotion, Robert, where, you know, fly EasyJet five times and you get to ask Robert Carey a question. Uh, you might be surprised to see uh, how much uh, consumer demand you get. Um, I think I speak for our audience members. This has been incredibly engaging. It's great to sort of hear uh, how this crisis has unfolded through the eyes of someone that has not only had to live it, um, but had to lead through it. Uh, and uh, it sounds that that EasyJet's 2021 is in great hands. Um, you know, I'll close with with one simple question, uh, and then give you a chance to say uh, any uh, last minute remarks. But you mentioned that you've already traveled a couple of times. As you look to 2021, what what are your travel priorities as a family uh, as travel becomes nor normal again? Where where do you want to go? Oh, uh, my, my my so to speak, my bucket list of quick travel places I want to get to. Um, uh, look, I'll start with the the, uh, the the easy one is I'd love to go back and see our, our family. So, uh, you know, my family's over in Arizona. Uh, my wife's family is actually in Indonesia. 
um, and we haven't been able to go see them in in over a year now. So uh, that's kind of you know, part of our normal routine. And and yeah, you know, my daughters are keep saying, when do we get to go? When do we get to go? So I think that's that's one that'll be on the list. Um, and and I love going to those places. You know, I think beyond that, uh, you know, we really we we've we've come to kind of do an annual ski trip. Really looking, hoping we can get that in this winter. Though that's probably the most borderline one that exists out there based on current restrictions. Uh, but we're hoping to do that. Uh, and then look, I think next summer we'll explore it. Um, you know, it's it's a back to the nomadic working lifestyle. You know, maybe we'll take advantage of that next summer because I think you know we're the one of the ways we're thinking about innovating is the way of working. As I said, yeah. you know, our teams may be different, so uh, I may be I may be joining this next version of this from a beach uh, somewhere around the world. Um, but I think getting getting international and out will be will be a core part of it. Good. Uh, well but yeah, I mean, just in closing, I just you know, let me let me say, and then I'll, I'll hand back to you, Alex. But I just want to say thanks, Alex, for 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 moderating and and to Anastasia and and Fortuda for hosting today. Really, really glad I could join. And uh, as as Alex said, look, uh, we'll we'll launch the promo out of here. Feel free to uh, message me on LinkedIn. You know, we'll, we're not even going for five flights, three flights on EasyJet, and you can ask uh, have a free uh, fifteen minute one on one chat of questions nonstop. So maybe I'll even come join you on your flight. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate it. Uh, and before I hand back to Anastasia, uh, I'd encourage you all to take a look. Someone did have a poll uh, on uh, on workcations, uh, and it looks like a reasonable percentage of people have uh, experienced a workcation. So that is a thing, as someone pointed out, uh, and great to see. Uh, a, certainly a nice way to live one's life uh, and in, in these complex times and, and something I personally uh, intend to keep as part of my personal repertoire. Um, so with that, uh, I'll close and hand over to Anastasia to, um, to finish us out. And thank you all for giving us an hour of your afternoon. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words and for such a wonderful session, Robert and Alex. Um, I think it won't be an exaggeration to say that um, COVID was a tragedy for many of us as an individuals and as businesses. But there is only so long we can look at it this way. If we want to recover, if we want to survive, we have to look at it differently. Maybe as an opportunity, if your context allows, but certainly as a catalyst for change. And I think Robert today demonstrated very vividly how this can be done within one organization, one company. Thank you so much, Robert, for sharing this valuable experience with us and such practical insights. Alex? Thank you for driving the conversation, incorporating all the questions we had in advance and during the discussion and making it so engaging and positive. And of course, I would like to thank our audience for finding time, for tuning in and for enabling these conversations with so many uh, comments, questions, uh, commentaries. Once again, thank you. And with that, I would like to wish you all a wonderful day and see you soon at our future events. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, Thank everyone. You. Bye.